So, <laughs> William Archibald Spooner lived from 1844 until 1930. He was the son of a bishop in the Anglican Church and was himself an Anglican priest and warden of New College, Oxford. He is less famous for what he did, however, than for the way in which he did it. William Archibald Spooner is the one who gave us what later came to be known as Spoonerisms. In sermons and in talks, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, Spooner would reverse the initial letters or syllables of two or more words. So, a crushing blow became a blushing crow. A half-formed wish became a half-warmed fish. And flea and tick spray became tea and flick spray. One of my favorite stories about Dr. Spooner has to do with his giving of a toast to the formidable Queen Victoria. What he meant to say was, God bless our dear old queen. John's got it. With his mind rushing faster than his tongue, he said, God bless our queer old Dean. <laughs> Another story concerning Dr. Spooner tells about a time when he was preaching, and he was preaching about the Lord is a loving shepherd. Today's Good Shepherd Sunday. The way it came out of Spooner's mouth was the Lord is a shoving leopard. And I thought about that. I thought about that this past week. The Lord as a shoving leopard. It's probably a metaphor worth exploring. The thing that strikes me about it is its immediate changing around of our usual thoughts and connotations of what it means to be a loving shepherd. That's what caught my attention. The changing around of a familiar or perhaps overly familiar image or metaphor in order to grasp a different aspect or perspective on the larger truth. So I want to do that twice in this sermon. That is to purposefully change an image or metaphor so that we see it in a different aspect. We see perhaps a larger truth. We see it in the bigger picture. So let's start with one of the most familiar images for Christians, that of the shepherd. Even the business world has borrowed our metaphor of shepherd for its definition of leader. A host of workshops, retreats, Self-help literature, etc., is educating us in the skills of leadership development and adult survival. Consultants are getting $2,000 to $10,000 a day for helping inculcate leadership skills in people and identifying methods and strategies for surviving on the journey of life. Think about it. Everybody wants to be a shepherd. Nobody wants to be a sheep. I mean, how many times have you been offered the opportunity to participate in a seminar on how to be a good follower? How often do we give instructions on how to follow an effective leader? When is the last time you've studied the art of followership? The answer is, of course, almost never. And the chances are pretty good that attendance at any such offering would be pretty scarce. Nobody dreams big dreams about being a follower. Nobody wants to grow up to be a sheep. Every so often, some democratizing concept, such as teamwork, finds its way into the discussion of leadership. 
My observation is that more often than not, teamwork means everybody working together to do things my way. Even in the church, maybe I should say especially in the church, we tend to all want to become shepherds or leaders in some way. We see our bishops as chief shepherds and our priests as local shepherds. My friends, far from testifying to the pastor as shepherd model, today's gospel lesson makes it clear that there can be only one shepherd for the flock, and that shepherd is Jesus Christ. The qualifications for being a shepherd are straightforward. You must be crucified, die, and rise again in three days. That is what it takes to be shepherd of God's flock. There is only one candidate qualified to be shepherd of God's flock, Jesus Christ. So, what do we do with leadership in the church, lay and ordained, and the images we use for them? I think we need to change the image for church leadership. Since none of us are capable of being good shepherds, I suggest that we use the image of sheepdog, or if you liked the movie Babe, a sheep pig. Good sheepdogs know the shepherd's will, and sense the shepherd's commands. Skilled sheepdogs respond to a variety of different whistles, a chorus of various commands, and work with the flock according to the shepherd's orders. The sheepdog's primary goal is to keep the sheep always moving toward the shepherd, eventually moving them into the safety of the shepherd's fold. Just as the really skilled sheepdog will use a variety of techniques to keep the sheep moving, obedient leadership may be marked by some distinctly innovative tactics. A good leader may even need to nip at the heels of a slow-moving heart or stubbornly wrong-headed idea in order to redirect attention toward the one who must really be in charge, Jesus Christ. Every leader is a good follower first, a follower of Jesus Christ. And I would add the characteristic of being a good follower of Jesus Christ first, the qualities of humility, a willingness to continue to learn and grow in the knowledge and love of God, an openness to listening to different perspectives, the capacity to care for, nourish, and nurture the people of God, a willingness to lead God's people into God's future, and an accurate sense of the limitations of one's own humanity. These are the characteristics of good leadership. I read a, a wonderful book a while ago entitled Pope Patrick by former Roman Catholic priest Peter DeRosa. It's a creative, funny, at times poignant, fictional account of the election and ministry of the first Irish Pope, looking back now, in the year 2009. Among other issues with which Pope Patrick deals, he makes some definitive decrees about the subjects of contraception, the celibacy of the clergy, and the infallibility of the Pope. In order to illustrate his decree on the infallibility of the Pope, he calls a press conference at the Vatican swimming pool, announcing ahead of time that he will demonstrate what he means in the decree he has issued by walking on water. <laughs> Pope Patrick arrives at the pool fully dressed in his papal robes. Ladies and gentlemen, he says to those assembled, for the world's benefit, I, the Pope, am about to walk on water. He steps out at the deep end of the pool and sinks like a stone. And that's 
his point. Only one close friend recognizes that Pope Patrick has done all this quite intentionally to declare to the world that even on matters of faith, the Pope has his limitations. There is one good shepherd, Jesus Christ. All the other leaders in the church, from the highest ranking bishop to the most eager lay leader, are at best good sheepdogs. There's a second image we might do well to enhance with a slight twist. The image of sheep or a flock of sheep is very helpful when we talk about our oneness in Christ, about God's call to obedience and unity, and about our proclivity to stray from the healthier ways through life, as in all we like sheep have gone astray. But sheep are fairly ignorant animals without minds of their own, and to most of us, they all look alike. When we look at the church today, whether we look at the Episcopal Church in particular or the Christian church in the world, we're not really a flock of sheep who all look and behave alike. We're looking at a zoo full of all different kinds and species of animal with lots of differences in appearance, behavior, and practice. When we see this zoo full of animals that we call God's church positively, we talk about the diversity of the people of God, and we look for strength in that diversity. I think the Apostle Paul does the best job in the entire Bible of promoting the acceptance of diversity within the church. Not only does Paul articulate such metaphors as the human body with different parts all working together, and he uses another metaphor of a building and with a variety of gifts and skills guided by the Holy Spirit. But read chapter 14 of Paul's letter to the Romans. He talks about a variety of differences among sisters and brothers and asks us not to judge, but rather to help each other out and compassionately practice a commitment to diversity in our midst. Ever since the Reformation and the birth of Protestantism, the church has found it easier to create new congregations and new denominations rather than tolerate genuine diversity within its ranks. The list of divisive topics that have given rise to new communions runs the gamut. Early Reformation schisms were usually based on scholarly theological disputes over lofty points of interpretation to the that were absolutely ununderstandable to the uneducated parishioners, even to theologians. Later divisions tended to be based on cultural, political, or behavioral differences. Some reasons strike us as profound, such as the congregational commitments to freedom in the 1860s and to civil rights in the 1960s, for African Americans, for people of all colors. And perhaps the first things you might think about are women's ordination and homosexuality causing divisions in the church. But consider some other disagreements that have even recently wrenched some congregations and denominations apart. Card playing jewelry wearing, dancing, drinking, TV watching, movie going. Would Paul have felt these reasons justified pulling apart the body of Christ? What about some of the really hot button topics that stop or start conversations today? Immigration reform and the status of refugees, health care, Abortion, economic vitality versus environmental health, married clergy, stem cell research, cloning, artificial intelligence. 
arguments between religion and science. Does Paul's advice call us to find a place for a multiplicity of Christian convictions on these issues? Or are there some simply inarguable points of truth? Paul does seem to have a bottom line on diversity, but it is hardly one that would bring any of us much satisfaction when arguing for our particular point of view on one of the issues that we so frequently argue about. What Paul insists is that all believers are united by Christ's death and resurrection. Accepting Christ's lordship is Paul's indisputable starting point. With the simple confession of a God-breathed, Christ-centered, spirit-driven life, we are all welcomed into God's household, and we all share the same humble rank as servants in that household. Honest, convicted differences are bound to exist within the body of Christ, but accepting them, not excising them, is the healthful attitude Paul encourages. It's when we can be a healthy zoo full of different kinds of animals that we can concomitantly be better sheep of the one Christ-centered flock. So, a loving shepherd or a shoving leopard? Good sheep leaders? or sheepdogs, a flock of sheep, or a bunch of zoo animals? In a very real way, the answer is all of the above. Jesus Christ is the one good shepherd. Effective leaders are committed followers. And the sheep while striving to remain centered in the one good shepherd, are also charged with the job of keeping the zoo together. So that, in the words of our loving shepherd, there will be one flock, one shepherd, to the eternal glory of God. In the name of God, amen.